Hey, Brandon. Thank you so much for joining us on the Unraveling Safety podcast. Um, I've heard a lot about you. And it's also been a pleasure to read about you and understand the vast experience that you have in the safety space. So why don't you just take a few minutes and just uh, introduce yourself to the fantastic EHS audience that we have listening to this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 thanks for having me also. I, I appreciate you making some time for me and, and including me in the conversations here. Um, so I've actually been in environmental health and safety for about 12 years. Um, started off in the energy sector. Um, that's where I, I got my start in the career and then moved into manufacturing for the bulk of the rest of it. So I've managed a EHS program for about five different companies now. And, uh, and now I uh, co-founded an online community for environmental health and safety professionals. So uh, while I'm not a practitioner in the field anymore, I am uh, you know, still highly involved in the industry uh, helping other EHS managers with uh, with anything that they need. Got it. And I think it's really fantastic to see the community that you've built at Safety Nights. Um, so, so Brandon, what can people learn from you? Uh, well, <laughs> hopefully, if they're following along on LinkedIn or or Safety Nights, they'll they'll learn from me that I I definitely have a passion for the industry, um, and and definitely a huge advocacy for. Uh, the people in this space, right? I mean, uh, there's so many needs that that EHS managers, safety managers, industrial hygienists have and need, and uh, and really, uh, I hope that they'll learn that anything that I can do or the organization can do uh, to meet those needs, we're willing to do it, right? So, so we want to assist them in their day to day, provide answers, foster that community where where good conversations, open conversations, can really be had. Got it. And what can the audience learn from you on this on this podcast? What would be the top two, three takeaways for them? Uh, I would say one, um, building a good safety culture uh, is really one of the backbones of an EHS program. You know, I don't want to say forget the OSHA regs, forget the ANSI regs. No, those are important. Those are you know, those are the, I guess, the step one of having a good safety program. But, but I think focusing on the culture, focusing on the people, um, that's that's really where I kind of uh, dive in, and that's what I tend to spend the most time on, really. Um, and and I would say two is that, uh, you know, fostering a good safety program, unfortunately, a lot of times means playing ball and speaking the language of. The people that employ you, right? So, you know, beyond the ethical reason to have safety, beyond the ethical reason to have a sustainability program or or comply with environmental regulations, right? Um, we got to be able to talk returns. We got to be able to talk, uh, you know, ROIs on, you know, what our program actually does for the company, right? Um, and, and unfortunately, and and I touched on this on today's post. I'm seeing a lot of people in the industry getting laid off lately, the jobs being eliminated. And, and I think unfortunately it's just due to that disconnect between, you know, senior level executives and, uh, and the EHS staff, right? Uh, so maybe they don't really understand what we do. Maybe they sort of understand, but they think, ah, well, somebody else in the organization can pick that up. It's not that hard. Okay. Um, <laughs> I got news for them. That's not true. <laughs> That's not even close to true. And, and, you know, the things that I'm seeing it, with these organizations that are doing that, uh, I think it's going to have long-term repercussions for not only the profitability of their business, but the culture and the morale. Right. So, so those are, those are some things that I think, you know, if we continue to discuss about that, it's, got those it. are some good topics. Got it. So let's uh, jump right into it. So, so starting with safety culture, right? like when it comes to everybody, a lot of people like to use that word these days. And we see a lot of posts over social media, all the platforms about safety culture. But it's also important to build or nurture very good safety leaders as well in this uh, to achieve the whole optimal safety culture. So, so why don't you maybe throw some light on what it takes to really build uh, good. What is a good safety leader? Why do we need that? What does it take to build it? 
Yeah, and, and as much as I want to answer that question, it might start to say with, you know, what safety leaders aren't, right? And and safety leaders are not safety cops, right? We're we're not out there to try to catch people doing the wrong things. You know, that's that's not the reason why we exist in the workplace. Um, you know, unfortunately, doing good observations, uh, doing good audits, inspections, you're going to uncover some things that, that need to be escalated, sure. But I think at the end of the day, right, punitive measures for for those not adhering to safety standards um, cause people to try and mask, right? They try to cover things up. And that's that's really not productive. Uh, when you when it comes to building that what we'll call safety culture, right? And and I think a lot of times safety culture and and just having a good culture in the workplace kind of go hand in hand. Answer, got it. So yeah, so I think you touched upon what what it's not, but also uh, then what's the right way to do it? Sure. Well, I would say too, right? Um, I've always been a huge proponent of getting to know the workforce, the environment, the people in the environment that I'm, you know, quote unquote, in charge of, right? Or or the program that I'm in charge of managing or leading, right? Because I don't think you can build a good program without actually knowing your people. Uh, I think ultimately the reason why people choose to be safe or unsafe uh, really comes down to decisions and and the the strong why of why are they doing something? Right. And you can't really answer that without getting to know them on a personal level. Right. Why is somebody working? Well, yeah, we need a paycheck. We work to to sustain our lifestyles. But uh, beyond that, right, we have families, we have people that depend on us. We have, you know, reasons that that we need to do the right thing and come home safe. Uh, okay. So getting to know that and being able to correlate it into your conversations. Right. Um, I think it's going to foster a lot more goodwill than somebody who never comes out of their office uh, other than to, you know, hand out a, a citation or, or in other words, you know, just come out to correct something, right? Because it's just not, uh, it's just not what people want. Understood. So basically, really understanding the people that you're working with or who's responsible, whose safety you're responsible for, right? which would mean to really spend time with them, interact with them, understand what's what's happening in their lives, the challenges that they face, what's going well, what's not going well, and understanding their journey so that we remove the friction towards them complying with the safety norms which are there to keep them safe. So yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, that, that empathetic style of leadership, right, to, to actually you know, understand where they're coming from, walking in their shoes, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I think you got it 100% right. Okay. And a lot of times, uh, these large, large companies or even growing companies, they, they of course, need to uh, optimize for efficiency, optimize for profitability and all of that. But also having downtime because of accidents, is something that takes away from the productivity and also from ultimately achieving the kind of eff efficiency that is required. But also sometimes what happens is the safety professionals, they might want to implement something within the organization. Of course, on paper, the organization will say that, yes, we want uh, safety is a primary focus for us. But a lot of times these initiatives don't always go through. Right. So, so what do you feel safety professionals need to maybe sh uh, get, get right in order to push these new initiatives in a very strong way to the management or the leadership to see it sail through? Yeah, that's a, that's a really fair point, right? Because it's, it, it's one thing to know what the needs are and, and to, to advocate for it from an emotional response. Um, but it's another thing altogether to be able to apply data, to apply stats, to apply dollar values to the things too, right? Because uh, whether it's a publicly traded company or not, uh, at the end of the day, a business is trying to make money. That's why they exist, um, you know, to, to solve needs, to make money for the, for the entity, the corporation, whatever you want to call it. But, um, you know, taking a look at the data, the stats, 
And, and again, if you don't have a, a, a good way to capture that data, it's really hard to sell an idea, right, from a logical perspective. Um, but I think it's important to have some sort of business case that you're generating for why you're choosing to uh, focus on a certain area, right? So whether it's, hey, I have these uh, injuries that have that have happened over the years, we've noticed a good bulk of them are in the, let's just say, musculoskeletal range, right? They're, they're, they're ergonomic related injuries. Okay, well, let's focus on an ergonomic pro program because the data is leading us this way, right? And we have the, we have the number of incidents to back it. Uh, another way, right, you want to be more proactive. You can use near misses, hazard identifications as a justification for doing these projects. But I also found that uh, having a good risk matrix or a good risk tool uh, to quantify your decisions is another way to go about it. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, so even the most standard of risk tools typically puts a, uh, puts a data point right around uh, it's, it's more of a calculation surrounding the frequency versus the severity of an injury, right? So if something, you know, happens quite or could happen quite frequently due to the number of uses and also could have a catastrophic impact, it might be something we want to look at first, right? It's one of the more um, higher ranked things that we need to address. And in using something like that, even if there's not data points around it, we can we can use that logic and that uh, rationale to drive a project. Uh, so there, there could also be situations where the safety team has put a good business case in place uh, where they quantify that, okay, this is, this is what has happened. These are the number of accidents, fatalities that have happened, hence, uh, this is how much of money we've lost because of this, and we need to take so-and-so initiative, which is going to cost us X amount of money, right? So there are going to be certain, and maybe this, this technology initiative has actually resulted, or there are case studies that show that so-and-so initiative really works. But there could be situations where the, the, the management of the leadership is coming back and saying that, hey, uh, this is a fantastic initiative, but probably we should look at this after a few quarters or maybe in the next year. Even though there is enough of um, um, revenues, there is enough of profitability for that company to, in it, to, to take this initiative, right? So in those situations, what should safety professionals do? And also sometimes what happens is safety professionals feel that, okay, maybe something is costing maybe like half a million or one million for this initiative. And they may not be so confident to go and even ask for that kind of a budget. So, so what are your thoughts about that? Like how, how do they uh, take this up with the right amount of uh, vigor to the leadership to get their buy-in? Yeah, so I'd say there's a couple things, right? My first thoughts is one, why are they cautious to bring this up to their leadership, right? We, we got to ask ourselves that question to begin with. Maybe they've tried to bring up other initiatives before and they've gotten shot down repeatedly over time. So they're not, they're not confident in, you know, the, the people that they need to get on board, uh, seeing it their way. Right. So that, that could be a reason. And, and I would say that's unfortunate, right? Because EH and S folks to really be effective at their jobs, they need to be supported by, you know, from a top-down perspective, right? So from the CEO down to everyone else, it, they, they need to support safety initiatives point blank, right? If they're not doing that, that could result in a, in a safety professional not feeling confident enough to uh, trust their training and, and, you know, use their expertise to guide the organization in the right way, right? So that was my, that's my first thought. So um, the other thing too is, and I've, you know, back from my sales days originally, uh, before I got involved in eh and it was, you know, when, when you know, and you know that, you know, confidence replaces fear, right? So being sure of yourself, knowing that you've done all the due diligence on an initiative, right? You've researched it, you've dotted your I's, you've 
crossed your T's, everything works, everything is in alignment, and you're and you're very confident of your decision, right? At, at, at that point, there should be no hesitation because you're submitting it to the board, you're submitting it to the next level up, maybe the CFO, maybe the people that that need to make the financial decisions. Uh, and, and if you're confident enough that you have all the data you need, you know, sell your case, right? Give them the reasons. Have a strong use case and what's the worst that can happen, right? They can they can either say yes or no. At that point, you've done your job. So also like when you when you implemented a particular initiative um, where you've you've built the business case, you uh, got the buy-in of the leadership. Um, do you also see certain situations where you get pushback from the people, uh, from the from the people on the shop floor, or people who are, have to implement this? Yeah, and that's uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I think you were going to ask a follow-up question, so I'll let you ask that before I hop in. No, please, please go. Okay, so yeah, that's the interesting. <laughs> conundrum or I'll say that's the duality uh, behind being an EHS professional right so anytime you want to make an improvement you're literally in the middle between the people that do the jobs and the people that make the decisions around profitability right so you're kind of in this space that's that takes a lot of nuance it takes a lot of I'll say negotiation right to um, to get what you need done uh, so that that's always a concern, right? Are the people going to respond well to the initiative? Uh, and I think again, and I'm going to loop this back to what I said earlier about being an empathetic and in, in, an empathetic leader, getting to know your people, right? Because if they know you, they know who you are as a person, what you stand for, right? They're not going to question your motives. The people that work at your company, they're going to know you are doing this, whatever it may be, for the right reasons. And whether or not they disagree with it, and you can have that discussion with them, they're going to know that your heart's in the right place. And I think that matters a lot. I think the amount of pushback that you get when you establish yourself as that empathetic safety leader uh, decreases significantly. Can you talk about maybe like a actual experience you've had while yeah okay. yeah i i won't name any companies but uh but yeah back when um back when my earlier days um it was actually my first ehs job in the manufacturing sector uh there was a real need for pushing through an ergonomic program to make jobs you know to to change job tasks around so that they were less impactful on on people's joints and and muscles, right? So, uh, one of the things that was part of it was implementing a a, a pre shift stretch. You know, it was granted. You know, pre shift stretches are not a silver bullet by any means. They they might be helpful in some situations, but ultimately, a true job redesign is is the way to go with preventing ergonomic issues, right? But but it's certainly helpful to get people to stretch and move their muscles and things too. So. Uh, implementing that group stretch program was something that when I first started it, the people didn't know me as well. They didn't, they didn't know why we were doing this. They thought it was silly maybe, and they didn't want to participate. But I think over time, once I established better relationships with the people, you know, the, it got better traction, right? And the same thing with, with really any other program. Uh, so people started showing up more to the, to the pre-shift stretches. Uh, they started actually doing them for real instead of just going through the motions as they did initially. So I saw a much better uh, buy-in with that initiative once, uh, once they really, once that relationship was built a little bit better with the, with the four different shifts. So I think it, it, it boils down to really connecting and empathizing with the people on the floor, right? Who are actually getting the work done. So it's just, yeah, 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 absolutely. And I would say too, if you don't have those relationships yet, maybe you're new, uh, it helps to make those relationships with people who are seen as empathetic leaders within the organization, whether it's a actual supervisor or just somebody who 
has done the job for a while and people look to them for advice and seniority, right? So, so you know, we can kind of, uh, uh, what's the good term for this? We can leverage our time by using those folks that, that are good uh, at being those leaders to drive initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. So interesting point that you mentioned, because when uh, typically we notice uh, EHS professionals, when they join a new a new company, they always want to want to create a mark, right? It would mean that, hey, I want to start this new initiative, implement this new new technology. But also I think what's what's really important is to um, kind of like stand on the shoulder of giants, right? Because you you're already riding that wave that they've already created and building on that momentum. So yeah, I think that's super important, right? So uh, what's the message you want to leave uh, safety professionals with? Uh, the, the message that I would leave, I guess if there's the biggest takeaway, it's, you know, use, use good leadership practices to not only lead the people that are doing the jobs, but to also steer the decision makers on when it comes to finance, right? And I know that's easier said than done sometimes, um, but uh, I'll say that that learning to speak their language is ultimately going to help the organization a lot. So focus on learning that piece. And if you can't, or if you don't know how to learn that piece, go find a good mentor, right? Seek out somebody in the space. And, and I'll give a blatant plug here to Safety Nights because there's a lot of great people uh, that are users of the Safety Nights platform who would be more than happy uh, to do some teaching, right? Or to to have some sort of mentorship um, if you're looking for that. So I think uh, to conclude, uh, safety professionals have to be great at sales, right? Because it's all about selling your idea, selling that concept to the people on on the floor, to the people out in the field, and also to the leadership team. So being able to talk it, being able to back it with the numbers and uh, yeah, bring, building that solid business case to ensure that uh, everybody buys into it. Yeah, I would agree. I would definitely agree with that. And maybe, you know, maybe you're not selling a product, but selling an idea, right? Or selling a reason to work safely or to, back a safety initiative it ultimately is sales yeah you you're right great all right thank you so much brandon for taking your time and sharing your valuable uh valuable uh, experience with the entire community thank you absolutely thanks for having me uh -huh.